Uh, well, uh, the Ipswich uh, River watershed features a great variety of environments. This uh, 19, or 1892 painting by Arthur Wesley Dow uh, suggests what some of those uh, features might be. Uh, there's the river, of course, and all of its tributaries and its headwaters. Imagine Algonquian birch bark canoes on the river. The watershed environment also features lakes and ponds, like this one in North Reading, freshwater swamps, beaver meadows in various stages, like this one in Middleton, uplands uh, forested with evergreens and deciduous trees, pine, oak, maple, salt marshes, which attract fish, birds, and deer, and clays could be easily dug from the banks and the estuaries of the Essex, uh, Ipswich, uh, and Plum Island Sound with their tidal flats and bountiful shellfish. Barrier beaches with dunes, like on the Green Trail here in Ipswich, and the ocean far and near. The Algonquians fished in Ipswich Bay and in the Gulf of Maine. Each of these environments offered vital subsistence resources to the Native Americans living here. Before the time of European contact, the diversity and year-round availability of diverse resources enabled the Algonquians to sustain a mixed economy with both seasonal resource pro procurement camps and permanent agricultural villages. You, unfortunately, or we, unfortunately, had a lot of uh, misinformation and conflicting information about who the Algonquians were who lived here and uh, when the English came. Historians refer to them as the Pawtucket, a branch of the Penacook, with homelands in the Merrimack Valley of southern New Hampshire. They spoke an Abenaki-related language. At the time of English contact, most of the area of the Ipswich River watershed was in the Sagamore ship of Masquenominate, the person you call Masquenominate. The southern fringes of the watershed were shared by Mohican and Massachusetts people. But today's talk is about how the Algonquians lived in the many environments of the Ipswich River watershed. One caveat, and that is to clarify that they lived here as one people, not different tribes. They were all the same people. The concepts of clan, tribe, nation, and sovereignty are European constructs. I may have mentioned this last time I spoke here. And the Europeans applied these concepts to the New England Indians, and the Indians ultimately adopted them uh, as their own. However, the people who lived here were not any of those things. They were cooperating and sometimes co-residing extended families who reckoned a common patrilineal descent. They called themselves the people, Ninu. So there was no Agawam tribe or Namkiag tribe, for example. Pawtucket, Agawam, Wemisic, and Namkiag were the names of their villages. In this presentation, I'm just calling them the Pawtucket. These are some attested Pawtucket villages in the Ipswich River area at the time of English settlement and their general locations. And here, the names appear the way the English wrote them. And here are the same places with the most likely real names, spelled more accurately based on uh, my reconstructions from the Abenaki language. Wamisit, Pawtucket, Kwaskwakikwin, Agawiwam, Jabacho, Wanasquiwam, Nahumkiak, Shinawanamity, Kochichuit. Here's what I have these names really meaning. The colonists inferred meanings of names based on what was cognitively salient to them. They were often wrong, but the interpretation stuck. Anasquam, however, does not mean pleasant harbor. It derives from Wanaskawam, and it means end of the marsh. So um, the problem is uh, how, to change, how to change this in the story. Everyone's so used to having things a certain way, it's difficult to actually um, change anything. As you can see, uh, Algonquian place names were strictly descriptive of geography, and therefore were not unique to any one place. There are many other places in New England called Agawam and Pawtucket, and other names like Agamenticus. 
we still have uh, misconceptions and stereotypes of, of, of the Native Americans of the Northeast. In addition to shared main villages, each Pawtucket extended family living in this area would have had a traditional habitation site at the juncture of two or more waterways. All trails and waterways were open access, and special subsistence resource areas were reallocated, divided, merged, or shared as needed. The estuaries of the rivers emptying into Ipswich Bay were especially important. During periods of seasonal migration from Wamisa to the coast, upon reaching their summer sites, the people would set their nets and plant corn. The estuary-based bioregions of Essex County would easily have supported a year-round population of around 5,000 people at a subsistence level, and twice that number with the addition of agriculture. Staple crops such as maize supported increases in population, population stability, and more permanent settlement. And these are the characteristics of an estuary bioregion that made them so important to the people living here. Algonquian villages look very much like Alan Pearsall's representation on the left, but with a greater diversity of wigwam styles. Winter villages and permanent agricultural settlements had as many as 25 wigwams, while family encampments at seasonal resource procurement sites might have as few as two. Wigwams were left in place for anyone to occupy and were repaired as needed whenever they were reoccupied. The first English settlers adapted Pawtucket wigwams for shelter. Um, being English, they didn't care for the smoke hole, so they added a chimney at one end and a door at the other, as you can see in the historical photo. Until 1639, when the General Court of the Massachusetts Bay Colony decreed that it was unbecoming for modern Englishmen to be living in primitive wigwams. Wigwam repair had a lot of components. Interiors had to be refreshed and restocked. Often, the thick bark used as winter covering of the wigwam frame was removed and replaced with thatch or woven mats for the summer. Once the poles were sunk and bent and tied for the frames and the sleeping port platforms, wigwams were entirely women's work. Wigwam <coughs> sizes ranged from single occupancy to ones that could house as many as 30 people. <clears throat> this historical photo around 1890 shows an Abenaki family in front of their northern style wigwam, which has just been fitted with fresh birch bark. The Pawtucket used a variety of house styles, uh, the round ones as well as teepee-like ones. This one slept about 10 people. The family is employed in a cottage industry of the contact period, making splint baskets and brooms and herbal memories, mem remedies to sell to the settlers. And they may have had an African servant sitting apart. Algonquians practiced slavery traditionally when it was convenient. Most Algonquian groups had a tradition of kidnap with enslavement, ransom, or adoption. This was a method of compensating for population loss in times of warfare, with enemy children carried off and re-socialized. Of course, they did this also with the colonists. Enslavement was also a form of punishment in their system of social control. A family could choose one of its low-status members to serve as a slave in compensation to a family whose interests had been harmed by another of its members. The Abenaki and others served as middlemen in the European slave trade, and of course the native people were themselves enslaved by Europeans. In any case, the Algonquians who lived here in the Ipswich River watershed followed these four main activity cycles, all interrelated and all based on seasonal changes in the environment as well as changes in the stars. The watershed offered key resources and subsistence enhancement opportunities at different times of the year. The people had intimate knowledge of the total environment, a deep spiritual connection with everything in nature that they regarded as animate, which included rocks and trees. And they had methods and tools for making a living that were simple, but efficient and very future-oriented. 
Uh, for example, uh, women selected and girdled trees for future use as firewood, with the trees taking years to completely die, at which time they could be easily felled and readily burned. This calendar gives an idea of what a resource procurement cycle might have looked like. Subsistence activities overlapped from month to month, of course. Transitional or travel months between main village winter camps and summer camps would have seen a combination of activities. Distances between settlements and villages and camps were small, typically less than 50 miles, usually just a day trip. So they were not nomads. And they did not move unilaterally or en masse. They were not a monolithic culture. Some people chose to stay in the main village and some families chose to stay at their camps, especially if a site offered two season or three season resources. Brothers might elect to establish a satellite village for their families as a shared resource procurement site. The people were busiest in the spring and fall. There was a lot to do. Because they lived outdoors, they constantly faced exposure and had very active lifestyles. Uh, there were bursts of intense activity interspersed with periods of leisure. Both men and women consumed nearly twice as many calories each day and more fat than is recommended for us today. The Europeans found tall, robust, and very fit people. Uh, for example, uh, Jacques Cartier, encountering the Beothuk in Newfoundland, noted in his journal that even some of the children were taller than his men. Spring was a time for gathering building materials or repairing things, setting nets and weirs, preparing the fields for planting, exploiting fish runs on the rivers and streams, gathering the first fresh foods of the season, and tending to the burial or reburial of people who had died over the winter. With winter cremations, the bones were collected afterwards and bundled together and stored for reburial in family ossuaries. 19th century historians sometimes mistook these ostuaries for evidence of cannibalism, like your Mr. Potter, who desecrated an ossuary on Treadwell Island, which is called Perkins Island today, and introduced the rumor that the Agawam Indian Indians, so-called, were cannibals. Attention to the upkeep of defensive fortifications was important because the Pawtucket coastal villages were attacked most summers by the Tarantines. And these were Micmac and Malicite people from Nova Scotia and the Canadian Maritimes. They came down the coast by canoe to raid the Algonquian cornfields because corn did not grow at their latitudes. The Algonquians of New England were also frequently at war with their western enemy, the Iroquois, especially the Mohawk, or uh, more properly the Kanyan Kahaka. To the English, the native forts looked like medieval castles because, as described by Edward Winslow of Plymouth Plantation, they had ramparts and moats with drawbridges and parapets from which defenders could fire their arrows and throw rocks at the enemy. That colonial perception has been preserved in place names all along the coast that use the word castle including Castle Hill, Castle Island, Castle Neck, Old Castle, and Castle View. Practically every town has an old castle, which would have been the site of a native fort or watchtower. Masquenominate's fort was on Castle Island in Castle Neck River, guarding Agawam Village. Forts at Sandy Point and Great Neck guarded the entrances to the Ipswich River and Plum Island Sound. Let's take a closer look at some of the spring activities as they took place. These are some of the resources that people gathered in spring, all of which are still here. The pictures show beach plums, dock, and trout lilies. You probably have tasted some of the things on the list. Some things had special uses. For example, pitch pine was collected to burn in lamps, to waterproof things, to glue things together, to treat wounds, and to ingest as medicine. Mushrooms you can still harvest here include, uh, starting at the top left, I didn't know I was going to have a pointer today, <laughs> uh, edible amarilla, 
Black Trumpet, King Bolete, and Dryad Saddle. Fungus were actually four season crops starting in spring. These all still grow here. And these morels, mushroom oysters, uh, excuse me, oyster mushrooms, chanterelles, and so on. There are many more. Uh, fiddleheads, dandelion greens, and wild onions or ramps were on the spring menu. The dandelion was uh, gathered early before flowering. I have a picture with flowers. Black cherry cherries are one of the earliest fruits and it's still abundant here. The people make jams and leathers with the fruit. They use the inner bark in their smoking mixtures. And the bark of choke cherry root is used medicinally to treat the common cold. Evening primrose, white goosefoot, also known as lamb's quarters, and plantain leaves were among the spring vegetables, eaten raw or cooked. And unless you have opted for the perfect lawn, you probably have these around your yards. <laughs> plantain leaves are also medicinal, used to make salves for cuts and abrasions, and also taken internally to treat diarrhea. These are edible flowers that still grow here, including thistle, native daylilies, violets, and clovers. Women and children gathered these in baskets and added them to dishes. Swamp roses, wild peas, New England asters, and wood sorrel are edible flowers. In another season, the Algonquians revisited some of these same plants to gather the fruits or the pods or the roots. And they also noted the location of stands of plants known to attract prey species or to provide nest nectar. For example, a grove of button bushes shown on the top right was sure to have a honeybee hive nearby. In late spring, edible bulbs became available. The bulbs of native wood lilies and water lilies were survival foods packed with nutrients. And lily pads are also edible, FYI. Just wash them very well first. Actually, you probably aren't even supposed to take them from nature, so forget I said that. <laughs> Medicinal and shamanic plants to gather in spring included skunk cabbage. Skunk cabbage is a hallucinogen, but don't eat it raw. It's poisonous. In spring, the people harvested spruce roots for cordage, especially for bowstrings. Spruce roots, spruce roots run near the surface. They're strong and flexible, and they're nearly unbreakable. And they gathered sweet grass for making coiled baskets. And you probably recognize the sweet grass, because it's probably growing in your yard. The Algonquians also gathered tussock sedge and your Spartina patens, or salt marsh hay, to use in the weaving of mats, in combination with corn stalks and cattail leaves. Dog bane, also called Indian hemp, milkweed, and bulrushes were harvested for stem fibers in both spring and fall. Fiber crafts were essential for many different uh, economic activities. Plant fibers were used for fishing line, nets, and ropes, as well as for weaving. The net needles that fishermen use here are an Algonquian invention. Cordage was also used to sew birch bark and to secure wood splint baskets. Animal sinews, in contrast, require lengthy preparation. They tend to stretch or shrink with the weather. They were preferred for sewing clothes. William Wood drew this illustration between 1629 and 1635 of a sleeping platform in a wigwam. It has woven mat walls and a rolled, woven mat that was unrolled for sleeping on. In winter, rocks heated in the hearth could be rolled into trenches under the sleeping platforms as bed warmers, and the people covered themselves with spruce boughs and firs. Other observers recorded the two main styles of weaving that the Algonquins used, shown at the top. For, for those in the audience who weave, they used the S-twist, or clockwise weave. The Algonquian division of labor, as well as the kinship system, favored men who hunted and fished and did the heavy lifting, while women and girls and young children did everything else, including all the gathering. Frogs and snakes and turtles were delicacies, but were also regarded as sacred because of the transformative nature of their life cycles. Butterflies and dragonflies were also regarded as having great spiritual power because of their ability to utterly transform themselves. 
The frog, snake, and turtle are common motifs in Algonquian mythology and symbolic representations in art and on the landscape. In an Algonquian creation story, Earth is created as an island on the back of a turtle. These are river herring or alewives in the Ipswich River on a spring run. Most coastal communities in New England have an alewife brook, and these were important seasonal resource procurement sites for the native people. Then, as now, spring fish runs attract river, river otters to the Ipswich. The Indians made weirs and rock corrals at waterfalls to trap or spear migrating fish, as at this dam at Ipswich Mills. Sometimes you can still see native stoneworks in the streams at sites like this. For example, this is uh, the uh, Amoskiad Dam in Manchester, New Hampshire, and you can see both native stone fish corrals below the dam, still there. At these places, young children would have stood on the rocks to observe fish and learn how to spear them. Yeah, after a while, it gets to a point where you have to, you can never look at a, a rock once. You always look at a rock. Keep looking at that rock. <laughs> yeah, all right. Sturgeon and salmon were prized, and they were plentiful in the Merrimack and in Plum Island Sound. Um, sturgeon were taken in both spring and fall in the night from canoes by lamplight. A uh, compound spear prevented salmon from wriggling free. Like other fisheries, these are all now endangered today, with salmon having to be stocked in lakes and streams. Smoking, sun drying, and fermentation were the methods of preservation. Early colonists uh, recorded these practices in their accounts and drawings. Smoked fish, meat jerkies, and dried clam meats were staple foods. Uh, they fermented fruits and berries, and rotted corn was a delicacy. It was made by burying green ears in the sand and later exhuming them. They also uh, made eggs the same way, very similar to the so-called thousand-year-old egg or hundred-year-old egg. Acquired taste. <laughs> Migrating fish were caught in both fresh and salt water at different times. These are all resources here in the watershed. The Algonquians fished using weirs, traps, spears, and bows and arrows. They also used dip nets, cast nets, and hooks and lines. They fished from shore, from platforms built out over the water, and from dugouts and canoes. They strung nets between headlands and offshore islands for channel fish and along the shore for surf fish. They used fish bodies as bait, especially the bodies of lobsters and horseshoe crabs. They sewed together the shells of horseshoe crabs to make durable, lightweight canteens and purses to carry food and water for personal use on long treks. Now, warriors, for example, might tie horseshoe pouches to their belts, one containing trail food, which they invented. They called it no cake. Uh, it had parched ground corn mixed with dried meat or shellfish and dried berries and nuts that could be reconstituted with water. Another horseshoe pouch might contain fire starting material, tobacco, and first aid material. Here are fish in your river, the cod, upper right, thorny skate, winter flounder, mackerel, Atlantic silver sides, and the little mummachog. The Pawtucket prized turtle shells and snake skins. They used soft, dried snake skins as headbands, hair ribbons, tump lines, moccasin laces, cradleboard ties. And they dried and pulverized the bones of snakes to add to dishes. Turtle shells were sewn together with sand or pebbles inside and hefted to wooden handles as rattles. Rattles were important accessories in dances and ceremonies. In spring and in fall, men and boys uh, hunted migratory birds in the marshes. Uh, boys would use butterfly-type nets or dip nets or cast nets to trap small birds like these uh, swallows. 
um, or the uh, soon-to-be-extinct passenger pigeons. But fall was the best time for fowling. Spring was the time to bury people who had died during the winter when the ground was frozen or to rebury cremated remains. There are many undisturbed and even undiscovered burial mounds in coastal towns, including in Ipswich. Locations are kept secret. Many Native American graves were desecrated in the past and robbed of their contents, and they're now strongly protected by state and federal laws. The Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, or NAGPRA, is prominent among them. Uh, throughout the nation, museum and other collections of human remains and grave goods are being returned to tribal councils for reburial and sacred ground. Archaeological excavations of any kind are strictly regulated in the state. These Algonquian burial mounds in the picture clockwise from upper right are in Salisbury, Gloucester, Middleton, and Newbury, just to give you an idea of what they look like. Summer was just as busy in spring, but the colonists often described the Indians as idle, with women doing all the work. As it happens, many summer activities involve gathering, which was the work of women and children. And hard work was in spurts uh, rather than sustained day, day to day, and leisure was prized. Unlike uh, many Puritans, the Algonquians had lots of games and sports and knew how to have fun. Gambling was a traditional pastime. Once the crops were planted, the men made weapons and canoes, they gambled, and they went on hunting and fishing adventures, and the women gathered, processed, and preserved shellfish meats and plant foods. The herbalists prepared uh, the medicines, uh, the women made paint pots and clay pots and splint baskets, they dressed deerskins and furs, and everybody partied. The Algonquians practiced slash and burn agriculture, also called Swidden agriculture. They planted in mounds between the stumps, which were eventually uh, removed. The potash rich mounds were heaped up after each rain to conserve moisture. People did not use irrigation, but did contour tour planting on hillsides that had gentle slopes and groundwater near the surface. A lot of effort was spent to locate and track groundwater. The picture shows preserved cornrows on the fringes of the old Wemisa Indian Reservation in Lowell, surviving from around 1695 when the site was last abandoned. Very rare to have that kind of preservation right on the surface. Slash and burn or Sweden agriculture is still practiced by First Peoples in other parts of the world. It is destructive in, of the environment, but only when forests are clear cut. The Algonquians retained windbreaks and groves. Because corn is a heavy nitrogen feeder, new ground has to be prepared constantly, and the people practice what is called mobile farming, moving crops to new locations and then moving their villages to be nearer to their crops. Colonists often had the impression that Indians had abandoned their village when they had merely abandoned some wigwams and made new ones in a location a little closer to where their current fields were but it was still the same village with the same name. The Indians also set controlled fires twice a year to clear the undergrowth in surrounding forests. They created grassy clearings as habitat for deer and heaths for berry bushes. Burning also kept trails and sight lines clear for travel and uh, safety from enemy surprise attack. This trail is right here on uh, County Road. Many explorers remarked on the vast stretches of open parkland created and maintained by the Indians through controlled burning. And this is what they planted in their mounds, to which they added crushed shell to sweeten the acid soil and to stabilize sandy soil. And as we all learned in the third grade, they used what they called the three sisters method of planting corn with squash and beans. The beans had something to climb, and the squashes shaded the corn plant's roots. Contrary to popular belief, they did not routinely fertilize with fish waste. 
Tisquantum or Squanto, uh, his real name was Tisquantum, showed the Plymouth Pilgrims how to use fish as fertilizer just to help them avoid starvation in their first year. The Mayflower people were attempting to plant imported seed in exhausted ground consisting only of glacial till. Fertilizing with fish was done only in real emergencies because the fish attracted carnivores that would then dig up the crop in order to get at the fish. Bounties on marauding wolves were among the very first laws enacted at the very first plantations in Plymouth, Ipswich, and Gloucester. They grew maize, which was domesticated in northern Mexico and carried to the northeast by the eastern woodland Indians. They invented popcorn. Indian corn kept the colonists alive and was even used as currency. Native Americans initially exchanged their land for bushel baskets of corn, preferring to benefit from colonial labor rather than their own. For example, they bought Gloucester. Uh, the English bought Gloucester in installments of bushel baskets of Indian corn until their last payment, which was in cash, seven pounds for 10,000 acres, including Essex. This is what a hill farm would have looked like. The women and children are harvesting green corn in July. Some squashes have been left to harden into gourds, which were used as water jugs. The boy on the platform is doing his stick as a scarecrow. He has a small arsenal of stones to throw at uh, the marauding crows. Later would be the fall harvest of corn left on the stalks to dry. For the short New England growing season, the Algonquians bred early maturing varieties of corn. They did this by saving the kernels from the very first ears to form on the stalk to use for planting the following year. The Algonquians also selectively drained beaver ponds like this one at Colt Meadow in Ipswich to plant in the rich lacustrine soil. Pumpkins, squash, peas, and beans are native to New England. You can still find peas and green beans and a type of melon growing wild here. You have to really look, but they're there. The common sunflower is native to New England. Jerusalem artichokes with their cheery yellow daisy-like flowers were cultivated in summers and the tubers were harvested in the fall. The colonists gave them that name because New England was the New Jerusalem, and Samuel de Champlain had written that the tubers tasted like artichokes. The Artichoke River in West Newbury refers to this plant, which still grows wild here today. Jerusalem artichoke um, is, is actually very common in the countryside. In the uh, background is Nicotiana rustica, one of two varieties of tobacco that still grow in Massachusetts, wild. Uh, the Algonquians combine Nicotiana leaves with sumac leaves and with other substances for smoking. Uh, they preferred Virginia tobacco, which was broad leaf and uh, often traded for it um, to augment their supply. These are some of the plants and shellfish that were gathered in summer. The picture shows a wild cucumber. Have you seen one? If you walk in the wetlands, um, you'll see them. Early settlers wrote, the abundance, uh, wrote about the abundance and size of shellfish. In William Wood's account, for example, he describes the women wading out from the beach, waist deep. They reach down around their feet, and in no time at all, they fill their basket backpacks with huge lobsters that they carry home. And the claws were eaten, and the bodies were used as bait. Oysters and soft-shell clams were a staple food, dried and preserved for winter stews. Dried shellfish meats were traded to inland people as delicacies. Algonquians often used hafted moose antlers to dig for clams that functioned the same way um, as clam forks do that are used today. Lobsters and crabs were daily fare along with oysters, scallops, mussels, and razor clams. Dog whelks, channeled whelks, knobbed whelks, and quahogs 
also provided the raw material for making wampum beads. For plants gathered in summer, stag's horn sumac was a, um, probably the most important staple. Uh, there are common uh, roadside plants here. The people dried and powdered the flowers and fruits to add to uh, nausamp, which was porridge, and to seasoned stews. The leaves were mixed tobacco, uh, as I mentioned, and the flower heads could be mixed with vegetable oils or animal fats to create an orange dye. All parts of this variety of sumac are edible when cooked and eaten young. Poison sumac at the top right is easily distinguishable from the edible kind. Daucus pusillus and Queen Anne's lace are wild carrots, uh, but Queen Anne's lace at the bottom is an import. The variety at the top, Daucus, is native to New England and still grows here along with other edible root crops. These roots variously taste like carrots or parsnips and have the same nutritional value. Northern wild rice still grows in your river. Canoeists and kayakers are in the best position to locate stands of this grass, which would be in the shallower tributaries. The women in the colonial illustration are bending the living plants over the gunnels of their canoe and thrashing them with paddles. The rice kernels fall into the canoe and then the plant is released to keep on growing. The woman on the left is on the lookout for enemies, Tarantines from the north who might ambush and abduct them. Summer was the time for berrying. We have a great many of edible wild berries here, as you know. These are blackberry, elderberry at the top right, and mulberry. Here are black huckleberry, low bush blueberries, native gooseberries, and high bush blueberries. In summer, the Algonquians harvested edible lichen that grows on rocks here. It's also called rock tripe and edible seaweed, such as sea lettuce and dulse. Medicinal plants to be gathered included strawberry leaves, along with the luscious fruits, sassafras, slippery elm, bark, and eastern hemlock needles. Medicinal plants clockwise from upper left also include St. John's wort, yarrow, mullein, and wild lettuce. Many native plants that grow here are medicinal. White cedar, arborvitae, arrowhead, fleabane, dogwood, jack in the pulpit, native magnolia, pokeweed, hemp, many others. Native medicine was specialized for treated wounds and infections, digestive and bowel problems, inflammation and joint pain, parasites, and menstrual and childbirth pain. Roughly 40% of the USP formulary for medicines today are Native American in origin. Medicinal practices were also spiritual and included smoking, fasting, purging, sweat lodge treatment, and all kinds of magic. Substances were taken at certain times by shamans or by individuals on a vision quest to induce a trance or out-of-body experience. No comment. Edible and medicinal plants are still common on the Ipswich River watershed. In this picture, uh, the Ipswich River has dogwood, canary grass, water lilies, and arum. The canary grass is an import, similar to millet and therefore edible, but used mainly for bird seed. But all the other plants in the picture are native to New England and were important resources to the Algonquians. They use dogwood hardwood for arrow shafts. Dogwood bark makes medicine similar to quinine for treating symptoms of parasitic diseases. The flowers and berries of dogwood are edible, though bitter, and were also used to make a red dye. The leaves and roots of palm lilies are edible, and the rhizomes of arrowheads or alum are also edible. Alum rhizomes can be eaten cooked or raw, or dried and powdered, and powdered and made into flour for baking. Algonquians who lived here would have hunted for seals in Plum Island Sound, Gloucester Harbor, mouth of the Merrimack. They rendered and used seal oil for body lotions, tattoo ink, lamps, cooking fat, and as a binder for pigments. Only bear fat was better. 
Mixed with graphite, animal oils make black face, face paint. Mixed with kaolin, white face paint. And with ochre, red, and so on. Paint stones are abundant in New England. The people here would have traded with the nipmuc for graphite from their mine at Tantuskias in Sturbridge. Grampus, a kind of uh, North Atlantic dolphin, and a swordfish. In some communities, getting a sword or a tooth was a badge of honor for a young man. Algonquian boys did not become men until they brought home their first large game from land or sea. And in some communities, a young man could not get married unless or until he became a proven deer slayer. The Algonquians were deep sea fishers, judging from the bones of pelagic fish in their sights. But they otherwise avoided the open sea. They created an inland waterway by cutting canals through the salt marshes. They connected the Merrimack with Plum Island Sound. They connected the Ipswich River with Essex Bay, and they connected Essex Bay with the Anasquam River via the Jones River salt marsh. The colonists attempted to maintain native canals and causeways for a time. Almost all our main roads began as native trails, including routes 127A, 1A, 133, and 62. Fall was prime deer hunting season, but hunting began in summer. White-tailed deer, like the one on the left, which is in Topsfield, were the most important prey land animal for subsistence. They were hunted individually year-round, but collectively in drives in late summer or early fall through cooperative hunting. Deer were hunted on the salt marshes and meadows when they came to graze and in the forest in fall and winter where they retreated to feed on bark and pine cones. Newbury, Topsfield, Georgetown, Boxford, and Andover were among the prime deer hunting areas. Here is Samuel de Champlain's depiction of a cooperative deer hunt near here, with drivers, corral fencing, hunters with spears at the choke point, and spring uh, traps snaring uh, deer by the lake. Every part of the animal was used. Bone, antler, meat, organs, sinews, hides, even hooves. In Champlain's picture, the beaters are using noisemakers made from deer hooves. The dancers wore ang anklets of deer hooves as rattles. A deer's bladder made a bag for transporting water. And the nasal bones of a deer make natural fish hooks. The Algonquians would have trapped your muskrats here and other small game. Muskrats' uh, waterproof hides were just as valuable as beaver skins. The people had many kinds of snares for small game. These were set at the entrances of burrows to trap animals as they emerged. Other types of traps were deadfalls in which the animal triggered the release of a weight and were trapped or crushed beneath it. Birds of late summer in the Ipswich River watershed still include egrets and herons. Archaeologists find the hollow leg bones of these large birds in Algonquian shaman's kits. Blocked at one end and capped at the other end, the tubes were used to contain special substances, such as macerated minerals for pigments, gemstone nuggets, and medicinal powders. Shamans also use the tubes as straws in certain curing ceremonies. A whole different way of looking at egrets. Birds were prized for their feathers, especially eagles and hawks, like this red-tailed hawk. Anyone of any age, gender, or social status could wear feathers however they wished. Feathers were not just for personal endowment and adornment. They had sacred properties, and they could be used to communicate with the Great Spirit. People used bird wings, for example, as fans to fan smoke from sacred fires. Individual feathers were used as wands to waft prayers to the sky world, and strung feathers were carried in a manner similar to rosaries. Eagle feathers were so important that access to them is strictly regulated by the federal government even today. 
Native Americans contributed to the decline in numbers of species here, such as bald eagles, plovers, and grouse, and they contributed to the extinction of the great auk, passenger pigeons, and native turkeys, as well as mammals such as the sea moon. The belief that Native Americans were always in harmony with nature is a stereotype. They practiced common sense conservation member measures, and they did not destroy living things for convenience or sport. But like humans everywhere and in all times, they exploited their total environment to the fullest possible extent. These descendants of the people who lived here are on the Stockbridge Muncie Indian Reservation in Wisconsin today. The bear symbolism and use of feathers in their procession is religious. Fall was just as busy as the other seasons. All the final harvests of the season's plants and animals had to be completed. The pilgrimage and trade and ceremonial calendars had to be observed, and preparations for winter had to be made. This was the time for the cranberry festival and the turkey hunt. In fall, the people cashed the year's food surpluses and supplies for the following year. Many left their summer camps and moved a few miles inland to their main villages or to winter camps in the woods. Harvesting, feasting, preserving foodstuffs, visiting, and gaming were the main activities. These were some of the most important things to gather in fall. They ground dried foods to flour. They crushed the conquered grapes in the picture into uh, and other berries for juice, tea, and leathers. And stockpiled pine cones to stuff with pitch for firebrands. All these things can still be harvested here in fall. Cranberries and rose hips are abundant here and high in vitamin C. Dried rose hips reconstituted with water and honey or birch sap was a fortifying winter drink. Honey locust pods, bayberries, and bayberry leaves were used to season savory winter stews. Aside from Jerusalem artichokes, another uh, uh, tuber on which both the Native Americans and the colonists depended was the groundnut, which is a kind of potato that was eaten roasted. The Abenaki name for them is Pana, and the most likely meaning of the place name Penacook is here are abundant groundnuts. Acorns of the white oak were another winter staple. These are the oaks that have the rounded leaves and not the pointed leaves. Don't try to eat the acorns with the ones with the pointed leaves. Um, acorns had to be, even the ones with the rounded leaves, had to be cooked in several changes of water to remove the husks and to leach out the tannins. Dried and powdered white oat acorn nuts made an excellent protein powder. It was used to augment baby food. And the flour also could be baked into cakes. It was a survival food in case of corn crop failure. Most popular were the hickory nuts, also called pig nuts, black walnuts, and chestnuts, all of which still grow here. And beech nuts, hazelnuts, and white walnuts, called butternuts, which are native to New England. The Algonquians made nut butters to flavor baby food. They added nut flowers to cakes and sauces. Now, along with inventing uh, popcorn and fruit leather, they invented Nutella. <laughs> Cattails were a key resource, today being overtaken by Phragmites. Cattail shoots are edible, and the stalks and leaves were woven into mats. Burst cattail fluff, along with milkweed silk, had many important uses. The fluff was gathered and stored as fire-making material. It was stuffed into your moccasins for winter insulation, and it was used as soft diapering material in babies' cradle boards. Cattail and corn husk mats were important for seating and bedding and to insulate the floors and walls of wigwams. Women used special heart-shaped palm tools to poke fibers into the weave. And the sewing of woven mats, baskets, and brooms gradually replaced fur trading during the contact period. Around 1900, this Algonquian family came from Maine in a canoe modified as a skiff to sell baskets and brooms at all the docks on the Anasquam River. They were the family of Santu Tony, her son, daughter-in-law, and grandson. 
They were interviewed and photographed by the ethnographer Frank Goldsmith Speck in Riverview. Gloucester Native Americans returned to Essex County in the late 19th and early 20th centuries on pilgrimages and to do business. Native Americans still visit ancestral sites in Essex County today as stewards of their past. In fall, the people took black ducks and Canada geese. Squirrel and porcupine hunting was done for the special purpose of providing decorations for clothing and accessories. Squirrel hunting was best done in the fall when the animal's tails thickened for winter. Squirrels required a special snare that took advantage of their tendency to climb in a circular fashion. The people used bolas to bring down bigger, clumsier birds, such as turkeys and Canada geese, like these in Willowdale. The bola caused less harm to the feathers than bows and arrows. The turkeys that are in the Ipswich River watershed today were introduced into the area and are a different variety than the ones that the Native Americans hunted. Wild turkeys were very rare here by the end of the 18th century and were reintroduced during the 20th century. Some eeling was done in the spring, but fall was the best time. Mature eels were trapped in baited baskets set in small streams. And like snake skins, the soft dyed eel skins were highly prized as headbands and hair ribbons, and tump lines, purse strings, and cradleboard ties. The Algonquians were involved in the northern fur trade from the earliest times, a hundred years or more before the English came here. Beavers were all but extinct in southern coastal Essex County by the time of English settlement. Optimal beaver trapping time was in the, uh, in the fall. In winter, frozen beaver dams and lodges had important use as water crossings. In fall, many people took to the rivers and lakes in canoes to fish and to trade inland. Horn pout or catfish and lake trout were delicacies. The photo of the Abenaki people in a canoe was taken at Odenak on the St. Lawrence River around 1890, but it could have been taken on the Ipswich River in the 17th century. The people at Odenak today include descendants of the Pawtucket of Essex County who were living at Wamiset in 1695. This colonial depiction shows Abenaki Indians in the fall fowling, trapping, and trading. The Algonquians of Essex County traded all up and down the coast and as far inland as the Great Lakes. This is a contact period seen because the people have rifles and one of their canoes has a sail. Winter activities featured clothing production, arts and crafts, specialized hunting such as the annual bear hunt, and special activities such as ice fishing on the lakes and the making of syrup from tree saps. And of course, there was also the fabled storytelling around the wigwam hearth. Oral traditions were scrupulously preserved, and many stories survive to this day. The stories would have been about Glooskap, the Abenaki culture hero, and his exploits, how he helped the people solve problems and make their wishes come true and have good manners, how he showed the rivers where to go and resolved nature's other conflicts, and outwitted evil spirits, changing shape and tricking them, and how he gave the animals their names and explained to them the deal with humans, and how he went away sometimes, maybe to Mount Katahdin, but always came back in the nick of time and fixed the weather, and told stories about the great spirit, the creator, who realized he must have created the world by mistake while dreaming, when he opened his eyes on the dawn of creation and saw a porcupine. Who in their right mind would purposely create a porcupine? <laughs> to the Algonquians, the world was not a rational place. Their religion was based on fear and the underlying premise that nothing is as it seems. The porcupine was not a mistake for art, though. It is redeemed for its quills. Tufts of fur and dyed porcupine quills were sewn into fancy dress clothing as status symbols, reflecting the difficulty of collecting them. 
This is a war shirt and some wedding dresses and some ladies' winter moccasins decorated with dyed porcupine quills. Clothing was also decorated with patches of needlework, embroidery, and beadwork. These examples are in the styles of the people who lived here. Beads were an important trade good during the contact period, and sites often could be identified and dated based on the types of European beads found in them. These Abenaki girls are wearing so-called Indian glass beads. They live at Odenak on the St. Lawrence River near St. Francis, Quebec. Their ancestors include Pawtucket, who were living at Wamisit in Lowell in 1895, who escaped to Canada when colonists attacked the village. This Odenak ancestor stands by the St. Lawrence circa 1880 when this picture was taken. A depiction of making syrup as one of the winter gathering activities, sugar maple and birch sap were collected and boiled in hollowed logs. The method of boiling was to heat rocks at a fire and then drop them into the water to bring the water to a boil. The boy on the right is carrying a hot rock in a basket to throw in. One of the first things the people sought following European contact was metal containers that could be heated directly over a fire. Their ceramic vessels were labor-intensive, time-consuming to make, couldn't handle large quantities or very high temperatures and tended to break. Clay pots and baskets were used for small-scale family cooking and food storage. But a kettle from the colonist was gold. Maple sap is still collected this way, less now, with ongoing climate change that is unfavorable to sugar maples. Chaga, winterberry, and partridge berry are among the very few edibles that can be collected in late winter. Chaga is a nutritious black fungus that grows on paper, paper birch trees. It looks just dreadful. You couldn't imagine that it could be eaten. But uh, it was harvested for winter drinks. The inside of it uh, could be scooped out and chopped up and steeped in boiling water to make a fortifying tea. In winter, they relied on their stores of preserved foodstuffs and dried or frozen meat or fish. Sea snails, dog whelks, chattel and knobbed whelks, and moon snails were delicacies. Children collected them for escargot as a winter treat. Also, all kinds of shells could be gathered after winter storms that the people worked into combs and small implements and beads. Shell beads were strung and woven to make wampum belts. The children also collected seaweed through, uh, thrown up by the storms to use for steaming shellfish in winter baking pits. In winter, anything with fur or feathers was highly prized. These are some examples of winter resources. The Algonquians invented snowshoes for mobility in tracking game and following their trap lines. This is, uh, the picture is of Gravelly Brook in Willowdale, where they would have fished for winter trout. Bears were sacred animals. Some communities conducted an annual winter bear hunt and a bear ceremony in a specially built lodge. Shamans observed the bear constellations along with the solstices and equinoxes and phases of the moon and the rising and setting of important stars such as the Pleiades. In the stars, the hunters with their dog chase the great bear. They fire their arrows and the bear is wounded. Its blood turns the leaves of the sugar maples red, but it lives. It retreats to its cave to hibernate and heal and then the stars waken and emerge again from the horizon to augur the coming of spring. Masquinominate's lineage had the black bear as its totem. Totem is an Algonquian word. The bear's uh, claw necklaces that men wore represented their affinity with the black bear as their totem. And the name Masquinominate translates as he who is named for the black bear. Moose, as here as you can see, moose antlers made good shovels as well as good clam forks. Moose were hunted in winter when they tended to bog down in deep snow. Uh, my Abnaki name is pronounced something like uh, Pumasako Moose. She walks with moose. I 
asked why they called me that, and I was told that I reminded them of moose. <laughs> I felt a little alarmed, um, but I asked why again, and they said, moose is strong to carry so much weight on its head, which makes it headstrong. <laughs> There's more. Moose is oblivious grazing on duckweed with its face underwater and so deep in thought it hardly notices where it goes and does not realize when it makes itself vulnerable. And I'd like to close on that note so as not to get bogged down. Thank you for listening.